now as we head to Albany in the East. We'll be tracking these games for you. NCAA basketball exclusive coverage on CBS Game 2 from Albany. The St. Peter Peacocks, number 15 seed against the number 2 seed, the UMass Minutemen. Stanford has already advanced. Tonight, Villanova and Old Dominion, and later on, Tulsa and Illinois. Good afternoon, everyone. Along with George Raveling, the veteran of 34 years of college coaching, I'm Mike Emmerich. George, we've just seen Stanford walk off the floor with a two-point win over UNC Charlotte. Your it was, observations. It was all about patience and impatience. UNC Charlotte had little patience coming down a straight stretch. Stanford had a lot rewarded with a win. All right, St. Peter's won the MAAC Tournament Championship. They come in with a lot of fire, a lot of enthusiasm on paper, though, a mismatch. Well, the biggest mismatch right now before the game starts is that St. Peter's will have played their fourth game on this arena floor in less than two weeks. And on the other and Randy side... Randy Holmes is one of the reasons that St. Peter's will be competitive in this game. He was the MVP in the conference tournament, and he's their MVP. When you talk about... UConn or UMass you wind up with a team that is number one in the AP poll five weeks this year and the first time a New England team has ever done that and you look down their lineup and it looks loaded it is loaded they've got TV Lou Rowe, all-american basketball player the thing we've got to keep an eye on there Mike is that he did not practice yesterday he was in Atlantic City at his grandmother's funeral and then on the other side we have that shot blocking demon Marcus Camby how important is he didn't play two games with an injury, you mask its beat. Let's take a look at some of these important guys on both of these teams. Starting lineup for St. Peter's, Mo Segar, Luis Arosa, the forwards, Bass DeFolk, the center, Mike Friendsley and Randy Holmes, the guards. Dana Dingle and Lou Rowe, the show. The forwards, Marcus Camby at center, Derek Kellogg and Edgar Padilla are the guards. Ted Fiore three-time Metro Atlantic Athletic Conference Coach of the Year, and he told his boys, just enjoy the experience. This is his ninth year at St. Peter's, and he's enjoying the experience. John Calipari in his seventh year as UMass head coach, 21-plus wins a season. He had 26 this year and gunning for 27 this afternoon. What would you expect at the outset of this one, Coach? I would expect... Now, St. Peter's will try to turn this into a half-court game, set a lot of screens, get good ball reversal, try to get everybody to have a touch of the ball in each possession. UMass, press, run, force the tempo, get the ball inside. Tom O'Neill, the referee, will put the ball in the air. Daryl Ogden and Zelton Steed. The other two officials to stand by is David Libby. The Minutemen 26 and 4, 13 and 3 in the conference. The Peacocks 19 and 10 in their conference, 10 and 4. Derek Kellogg, the senior out of Springfield, Massachusetts. Padilla, no opening. Rowe couldn't get it to go. That's Lou Rowe's favorite post. Is a turnaround jump shot. He prefers that over to taking the ball to the basket or shooting a jump hook. Double zero is Mike Friendsley, the tournament hero, with the ponytail. Lost out of bounds. Mike Friendsley is one tough little sucker, boy. He's their leader out there. He's their glue. Taking that ball out of bounds. One of the few players you'll ever see that does not wear socks. Well, his socks are flesh-colored. Would not go for a Rosa. In a hurry, you Matt. Oh, Camby. Camby showing a little point guard skill. Arosa leads ahead to Randy Holmes. Behind the back and in. Back quickly is Kellogg. This St. Peter's team is a very sound defensive team in there. They're coming out playing with an awful lot of confidence, Mike. They certainly don't look intimidated by me. Did someone tell them that this is the UMass team that's ranked in the top five in the nation? 
someone at the top of the show mistakenly told him it was UConn for a moment. Off the rim. And out. And it'll go to St. Peter's. Randy Holmes, Mike, is their go-to guy. Excellent one-on-one -on -one moves, and we're going to see one right here. He made the defensive man pay for the reach at the ball, took it behind his back, pulled up, and shot the soft jumper. Arosa. So, first foul of the afternoon against St. Peter's. You're right. They are, they're tough-looking guys, these St. Peter's guys. They don't look like they're going to give a thing. And the seeming leader of that toughness is the guy you see in double zero, Mike Friendsley. I think St. Peter's is inspired by Manhattan's win. They want to show people that this conference might not get a lot of publicity, but we can play basketball with the big guys. Seagar driving. Friendsley. Good. The first four points belong to the Peacocks. Nearly a mishandle by Kellogg. Friendsley thought it was. Camby. Arosa to Holmes. They both laid it in. Six to nothing. Mike, Mike Friendsley had a stretch where he went three games in a row without a turnover. That's incredible. He went three games in a row without a turnover. Kellogg lobs for Rowe. Kellogg for three. Dingle. The first basket for UMass. Dingle. He does a great job of complimenting Rowe and Camby inside in there. Takes a lot of pressure off him, particularly from a rebounding standpoint. Turnover by St. Peter's. Padilla. Dingle, but no. Dingle a foul. Friendsley has got the whole package for, for St. Peter's in there, Mike. He really moves well without the ball, and there was a great example of moving down and getting parallel with the, with the penetration, kicked it across the court, picked it up, gave the nice shot fake, and got himself a wide-open jumper. What set the wide-open jump shot up was the shot fake, lifted the defensive man off his feet. Did you ever coach anyone in 34 years that had this sort of a uh, style statement? Well, isn't his picture on the on the, on the, the 25 cent coin? Luisa Rosa with the jump left hook, eight to two. Thus far, there's no intimidation factor. Dante Bright, Dante Bright with a nice lead. He's oh. very effective when he puts the ball on the floor. He's a much better offensive player off the dribble than he is standing still. St. Peter's four for six early. Luis Arosa. Push it up. Six-point lead is back again. Arosa with four. Arosa has a scoring mentality. When he touches that ball, usually his first instinct is, can I score? Foul underneath. Will the basket count? UMass wants it. They may need a conference. Second foul to Arosa, the big man in trouble. We'll be back to Albany in just a moment. St. Peter's 10, Massachusetts 4. Early in the first half. Dante Bright. A nice inside-outside patience in there by UMass. Results in a basket for Bright. Four points for him out of his team six. Throw away by the St. Peter's Peacocks. Boy, it's got to be hard when you're an underdog to keep calm when you go to an early lead like that 10-4 was. Well, he should have came back to meet the basketball in there. Cal Perry had said yesterday that he was going to put a lot of pressure on him and see if they could handle that pressure. 
log in the row and the reach in. Mo Seagar called for his first foul. In Jersey City, New Jersey is where St. Peter's is located. Enrollment of about 4,000. The Metro Atlantic Tournament champion this year. Second time they've been in this tournament. And of course the Atlantic 10 Conference and the famous team in that UMass. Ranked number one five weeks this year. Mike, St. Peter's has got to be careful here that they don't get uh, UMass in the one and one uh, be before the 10 minute mark here. They they've already picked up three posters. Is Tom the best thing now for St. Peter's? Well, I think, they accelerate. No, I, I think St. Peter's has just got to stay with their game plan and just be patient. Good things are going to happen to them. The both battling. Don't go for him. Right looking over the traffic and Kellogg for three. <laughs> Loud reaction to the air. Okay. A nice post speed on a bounce pass in there. Lou Rowe getting the shot off of the three defensive guys. How important is Lou Rowe? He gathered three defenders on him, and he still was able to get a quality shot off. I would think that, that St. Peter's might want to make an adjustment and front the post man in there. Make Lou Rowe have to work a little harder to get the ball. Right now, he doesn't have to work hard to get that ball at all. Peacock's had to work hard to get it over the line. Marcus Camby sure have been out of the game a long time. Foul to Weeks. And Dingo comes back into the lineup. Team fouls being racked up rather early here. I I'm curious, Mike, as to whether John Calipari sensed that this game's going to be called very close by the officials, and he decided that they can be out for a while and go with Weeks, and if fouls had to be pick up, picked up, let Weeks be the one to pick them up. He just brought Canby back in the game, though. Brian Griffith just into the game for St. Peter's, spots one. Travieso for three. Now more deliberate. Dingle. So now the deficit for UMass is just two. Dingle just does a, a fantastic job of complimenting Lou Rowe and Marcus Candy. It'll go back to UMass. Early adrenaline rush for St. Peter's, and as much as a 10 car should have put this pass with a much higher arch on it. A higher arch on this play here would have resulted in a basket. But a nice, hustling, all-out effort by Mike Frensley there. Lou Rowe's going to have a field day unless they start to front him in there. Didn't get that one to go. Brian Griffith behind the back, but a little too fancy, and here comes UMass. Mike, I think St. Peter's might be a little too loose out here. Traveling called on Camby. It's a good sign that they're playing their game. And they're, and they're moving the ball quickly and, and staying aggressive on the fast break. Here's Camby with the big, gigantic step in there. An obvious walk. St. Peter's has turned the ball over five times, but this time, a lead over to Davis. But no bucket for him. Recovery by Jones. St. Peter's obviously has watched enough film on UMass to understand that they can beat him on a long baseball pass for the easy layup in there. It was over. Another turnover for St. Peter's. They have the lead 12-10, 12-37 to go. Mike, there's six turnovers now by St. Peter's. What's happening now is UMass is creating a tempo that's favorable to them. They've got St. Peter's playing a little faster than St. Peter's wants to play. Camby. 
right over the top of Sherrod Jones. Excellent patience by Camby in there. Read the defense, stay patient, make the appropriate move, turn, shoot the soft jump shot. Ryan Griffith on to Arosa. Luis Arosa. The Saint difference Peter's there, Mike, was how patient St. Peter's was. When St. Peter's is patient on offense and gets four or five touches by the players on the floor, good things happen to them. they got to continue that. Camby. So now they're trading baskets. 14-14. And that's a game that St. Peter's can ill afford is to trade baskets with UMass. UMass has got better talent. But better talent doesn't always mean a better team. Arosa again. Got it again. Eight points for Arosa. Half of his team's total. Arosa was the first team all-conference player, so it shouldn't be any surprise that he's playing as well as he is. Camby gets some rare air. Arosa has a scores mentality. When that ball touches him, he wants to score. He wants to score. He wants to shoot. He does it again. No. Possession. And possession will be for you, Matt. A surprise early. 16-14, St. Peter's. Knickerbocker Arena, outside in Albany, the state capital of New York. One time, there was a basketball team called the Patroons that played here in the CBA, and they had coaches like Phil Jackson and George Carl. The main tenant now is a hockey team called the Albany River Rats in the American Hockey League. St. Peter's has to feel more, most fortunate to, to be down two points after committing six early turnovers in there. The key to the six turnovers, Mike, was the fact that UMass was only able to convert two points out of the six turnovers. Another turnover that time, traveling and the shot clock at the same time. Dante Bright to Padilla. Bright. St. Peter's ball. St. Peter's intensity seems high. UMass seems low. I, I think that the big men for UMass are awfully intense. The guards don't appear to be very intense to me. Along with George Raveling, Mike Emmerich from Knickerbocker Arena in Albany. You're reading correctly. Early stages, the underdog St. Peter's with a two-point lead. Boss to four. Mike Friendsley for three. Off of the folks. Brought back now by UMass. UMass likes to push that ball up the floor as quickly as they can after a made or a missed shot. They've got Lou Rowe posted on that left box again. Every time he comes down and sets up on that le left box in there. Rowe is fouled. Mo Seagar for the second time is called. One of the things that UMass likes to do, Mike, is they like to go to Lou Rowe early, get him a lot of touches, a lot of scoring opportunities, so that it builds his confidence. Dingle is back in. Dante Bright is out. Well, the big scores, that's almost a cardinal rule, isn't it? Big scores, you want to get them with some points early. We also want to see how uh, St. Peter's is going to defense them in there. And thus far, St. Peter's has been content to stand behind Luro, let him receive the entry pass, and then try to double down on him. Three air balls so far for you now. Out of Holland. 
friendly. UMass ball, 8.45 to go. And UMass trailing by two. Inside for Lou Rowe. Traveling call. The, the problem that, that UMass has here is that they're just continuing to go down inside to Lou Rowe in there because St. Peter's is playing behind him. The temptation now is to keep going to Rowe, and as a result, you don't get the other four players involved in the offense. And it could be difficult to get the other four players back into the offense. Padilla fouled Holmes. Padilla's first. Well, this looks like that the peak of St. Peter's performance is right now, and UMass almost hasn't gotten into the game yet. Well, and I'm not too sure it's not because of UMass's offensive approach. You bring the ball down, you set Lou Rowe on the left box, you swing the ball to the left, you try to go inside the Lou Rowe, and what does it do? It leaves the other four players standing on the perimeter. The more often they do that, the more lethargic they become. And then it transfers to the defensive end of the floor. St. Peter's by four. Kellogg and Dingle. St. Peter's has switched to a zone, 2-3 zone by St. Peter's, giving UMass a different look in there. Kellogg for three. Mike in the 2-3 zone, St. Peter's likes to match up out of the 2-3 zone. Basically what we mean by the matchup is that they're playing man-to-man -man defense with zone principles. Default. Got by Camby and fed off. Holmes, the both. That's his shot. That's his shot. He's a good face-up jump shooter in there. Camby off the glass. What was impressive about that was the fact that here you have a seven, uh, almost a seven-foot player out filling a lane on the break. And not only did he not choose to go for the layup, Mike, he picked it up and shot a back, a jump shot off the backboard in there. It shows you the versatility of Marcus Camby. It shows you why people are so excited about him. Padilla on the reach. Play is stopped here in Albany with the score. The Peacocks, 18. He's a player. He's going to come out and challenge the shot right here. He's going to make him shoot a little higher. Now watch him get out and fill the lane. At 6 foot 11, he fills it. He runs wide, catches the ball, squares up, puts it in off the backboard against multiple pressure. Can be in there right now defensively. 18 16, St. Peter's. Holmes over to DeVos. Cigar around to Arosa. Holmes driving. Tipped by Arosa and in. St. Peter's by four. St. Peter's is desperately trying to keep this into a half-court game. And they continue to swap baskets, Coach. Well, what, what I think St. Peter's needs to do defensively, and I think they will do it here soon, is they've got to either play up on the high side of the offensive post, man, or they got to front them. They cannot continue to allow those easy entry passes into Rowan Camby. Only one assist so far in the game for UMass. Their average is around 18. Foul underneath. And if that's on Seeger, it's three. Ten points for Orosa. He has been the best of the Peacocks. Camby with eight. The shooting percentage for the Peacocks is above half. And that's because of the, the really sound man-to-man -man defense that St. Peter's is playing. They gave him a look at a 2-3 matchup zone there for a while, but basically St. Peter's is a man-to-man -man defensive team. Seeger with three fouls has to sit, and Jerome Davis is in in his place. Dingle with a little trouble. They work to Camby again. No glass on that shot. Arosa. The 
both maneuvered remarkably underneath. Arosa again. Shot it, went to get it. But it is UMass ball. He doesn't stand there admiring a pretty shot, does he? Arosa's never seen a shot he didn't like, Mike. <laughs> But, but but that's part of the, the, his offensive persona. He has an a, amazing a, a confidence in himself that he can score and score on anybody. He's only missed twice. Camby. Jerome Davis up with it, and Friendsley will bring it back. Friendsley's the glue that makes St. Peter's go. He keeps them calm. He keeps them in their half-court offense in there. Make sure everybody gets a few touches of the ball. And he can shoot it. He might be a little too conservative out there offensively now. And just as I said that, he comes up with a big one. He's a cocky little player. Collectively, St. Peter's chins are thrust right out at UMass. Weeks. Got it. St. Peter's lead is back to two at 22-20. Already the count is on. They've had some trouble getting it on the double team, but this time they're able to break it with Jerome Davis leading ahead to Defoe. Seven feet tall, lost Defoe. Number 34, tallest player in the history of St. Peter's basketball. Arosa. He is persistent, but this time UMass comes back with a chance to tie the game. Smart play by Dante Bright to back that off. He didn't have a good opportunity to score there. Took it back out and set it down. Allowed Marcus Camby to get down the floor and get into an interior post position. Jerome Davis with the foul and Ted Fiore's face is red. Ted Ferroy grew up and wanted to be a big league baseball player. Was in the Cincinnati Reds organization. Third baseman. Started out like I did, Mike, in coaching. My first coaching job was in the CYO in Philadelphia, and his first coaching job was in the CYO coaching Sacred Heart. It matters, but do you recall your salary in that first coaching job? I had two Big Macs in the shape. <laughs> but that was if I drove the school bus. Second one doesn't go for Bright, but Weeks puts it up and in. First lead of the game since the early stages for UMass. Two-point jumper by Holmes. St. Peter's with its lead back. Billy Stein, the athletic director at St. Peter's, told me he thought he was the best player in the, in the conference. Some battling underneath. Foul called on UMass. Play is stopped here in Albany with the score. The St. Peter's Peacocks leading the Minutemen 21. George, what do you think this game means to St. Peter's? Well, to St. Peter's, I think this is an opportunity game. It's an opportunity to get respect. It's an opportunity to get national exposure. And it's an opportunity to advance to the second round of the NCAA tournament. And UMass? UMass? UMass is playing for the national championship. That's all they're thinking about. Holmes with a fancy move. Padilla brings it back. Kellogg in a hurry. St. Peter's continues to exploit this press with the baseball pass, which immediately releases all defensive pressure. Along with George Raveling, Mike Emmerich from Knickerbocker Arena in Albany, New York. St. Peter's leading UMass 24 to 23. Latter stages of the first half. It wouldn't go for Sherrod Jones. Possession arrow. And it is UMass. 
the storyline here, Mike, is the fact that St. Peter's continues to control the tempo of the game. They, they want to make this a half-court offensive game, and they've worked diligently to do that, and more times than not, if they could successfully attack the press, they've been able to make it a half-court game. And they stopped turning the ball over. So maybe they weren't at their peak in the early stages of this game, but are actually getting better. I think so. They seem to have really calmed down now. They're going to their, to their chief offensive players in there. They're keeping the ball in Holmes' hands as much as possible. Rowe. Lead back for UMass. Rowe with four points. And Sonny Chaplin brings it out. Sonny Chaplin is a transfer from the University of Texas. He's a really good offensive player. He likes to play facing up. You wouldn't expect many people to think that with 18 minutes played in the first half of this game, that it would be UMass by only one, and that St. Peter's would have had almost all the lead time. UMass brings it back. Edgar Padilla working it in and getting it back. Tries for three. Rolled down by Sherrod Jones. St. Peter's does a good job of blocking out in there and they're sending all five players to the defensive board. Foul in the act of shooting. A three-pointer. Coming up on Benzoil at the half, Pat and Clark will have live look-ins from the NCAA tournament. Mike, stepping to the line right now is Randy Holmes. The wrong guy to put at the line. He has made 27 straight foul shots. 27 straight. Let's see if he can extend that streak right now. And being down one, St. Peter certainly needs him to extend that streak. Game tied at 25. Padilla sits with three. They carry a lead into the locker room. What's the biggest problem Ted Fiore has with his Peacocks at the half? Well, I don't think he has a problem. I think that what he's got to do is, is, is to keep them in a present frame of mind. He's got to say, fellas, you executed the game plan perfectly in the first half. Let's see if we can go out and put 20 more minutes together like that, particularly at the defensive end of the floor, and particularly blocking out. Kellogg's three didn't go, but a foul underneath. The thing that, that concerns me right now, Mike, about UMass, is they have very little perimeter offense. St. Peter's has lulled them into believing that they can beat St. Peter's by putting the ball down inside in the post, and as a result, uh, they get no second shots at the basket if the post guy misses. Took UMass to the last minute and seven of this first half to get the one and one going for it. Rowe got them both. They call him TV Lou because he's played his best games on national television, and he's going to have to have one of those type of games here today. Steps called on St. Peter's. He's a great kid, Lou Rowe. I had him on the Goodwill team this summer. Camby. The jam fails, and Holmes brings it back. No, in the cylinder. Basket interference, and it'll go to UMass. Okay, here's a nice lob that can be in there, hanging on the rim, but that was a legal play. The player stepped under him. I have no problem with that, neither did the official. Rowe fouled, and it goes. A great example of how powerful a player Lou Rowe is inside. 
Okay, here we go on the fast break. Nice stop and go move by Holmes in there. Puts it up on the backboard. Just avoids the block. Touched the ball while it was on the rim in there. Lost and a foul. Dante Bright with his first. Sherrod Jones, number 41 for St. Peter's, Mike, was far more highly recruited for football than basketball. He was recruited by such schools as Miami and NC State as a football player. He's coming to the foul line right now. And when you look at his physical presence, you can understand why Miami wanted him. 6'8", 225. Cinnamon from New Jersey, but it won't go for him, and a foul right off on the rebound. And so back it'll come for a UMass, one and one. Well, he's aggressive. Miami could have used that in the ball game. He loves to bang people around. Some concerns for John Calipari at halftime. His team has come back now and is starting to widen. I, I, I really believe right, right right now that UMass is, is, is okay. I, I, I don't think it's any time to panic right now. In fact, I think Calipari ought to feel pretty fortunate about where they stand right now. St. Peter's will milk this one down pretty good. Jones couldn't get it to go. Now the milking will belong to UMass. 16 seconds. Their lead is three. I think they're going to cross screen for Lou Rowe, bring Lou Rowe to the low post. There he is. For three, Kellogg. Three. this play up right here was the Lou Rowe as the threat. They brought him across on a double screen. Mike Frinsley was a little hesitant to come out. Picked it up and shot it. End of the first half. UMass 33, St. Peter's 27. CBS Sports exclusive coverage of the NCAA basketball champion continues after this from your local station. Peacock's 27, and we've been walking down press row, and everyone seems to have the same reaction. Interesting so far. Well, the difference right now in the basketball game is UMass has 10 points off of the bench, and St. Peter's has two. Of course, St. Peter's doesn't have as long a bench as UMass. What do you think of Marcus Camby in the first half? Marcus Camby right now is not doing a good job of rebounding. He only has one rebound in the first half, but he's found another way to contribute, and that's offensively. He's really dynamite down inside in the post, but at the other end of the floor, Luis Arosa is, 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 is countering everything that Camby's given him. He's, he's been able to come off the down screens for the face-up jump shots in there. The thing that St. Peter's continues to do is to get him shots in the area in which he can score best. And as we go to the shot chart, you'll see that St. Peter's really got him shots in the area that he really likes. Want to check out the halftime stats. First of all, they're even in shooting percentage. Turnovers 10 for St. Peter's to 4 for UMass. And... No three-pointers for St. Peter's, but only one try. Now, what about that shot chart? And here's the shot chart that I spoke of early. All in the area in, in which Arosa is most dangerous. If, if St. Peter's can continue to get him those quality of shots in the second half, then they, they're going to be in good shape. Okay, Coach, pretend that you were Ted Fiore the previous 15 minutes. What do you tell your squad? Just keep playing the way you are, but take care of the basketball for me, folks. Take care of the basketball. And John Calipari? Right away, they go to Holmes, their go-to guy. Try to see if they can get him, shake him loose for the three. Clock one. 
So far, Stanford a winner by two over UNC Charlotte. Tonight, Big East Tournament champion Villanova against Old Dominion, Tulsa, and Illinois. Full day of NCAA basketball on CBS. We hope you're enjoying it. Lou Rowe called for his first foul. Mike, when you look around the country today at the close score in the Texas Southern Arkansas game and the Murray State North Carolina game, it tells you just what everybody's been saying on how much parity there is in college basketball today. Marvelous move by Holmes. And the first basket of the second half goes to St. Peter. Camby. And the basket trading now. UMass is doing it from a six-point advantage. Before, it was a four-point and two-point deficit. Randy Holmes has made an amazing turnaround. Last year, his season really never got on track because he had a stress fracture in his leg. DeVoe put it in. That ball was tipped by Marcus Camby. He just barely got that over Camby's head. Looked over Camby this time, and the smallest man, Mike Friendsley, comes up with it. The pace is really picking up. I don't think St. Peter's wants to continue at this pace. Arosa. Yes! Leroux, second foul. And Arosa with a chance to get his team back to within one. Second foul in less than a minute. They continue to put that ball down in an area where he can score. Nice shot fake in there. What made the play, Mike, was he had the presence of mind to lean into Lou Rowe to make sure that on his downward flight he stepped into him. He's having the game of his life right now. What a time to have it. And they get the ball. St. Peter's trailing by two. Arosa. Denied him. They try the other way and that fails, but a good recovery by Defoe. Seagar. Game tied. Seagar was the best defensive player, but he's turned up the heat offensively. You mass rushing their shots now? No question about it. I think they've become a little impatient. It doesn't appear that they came out of the locker room focused. Weeks with his third foul. Yeah. UMass can ill afford that. They've got Lou Rose sitting on the bench with two. They got his backup. Tyrone Weeks with three. This could be a big factor. Arosa back for the folks, but blocked. Talking about those hurried shots that UMass seems to be doing this half. Is that a concern at all to St. Peter's? If, if, if you're St. Peter's, you're happy as all get out that they're shooting the ball uh, quickly. Because number one, if they shoot the ball quickly, St. Peter's doesn't have to play defense very long. Number two, if St. Peter's gets the rebound and takes it back down the other end, as patient as they've been, it means UMass has to play defense a lot longer time. So all UMass's energy is being put into defense. Kellogg with the first of two, puts his team back ahead, 36-35. He has four points. Arosa with the rebound. UMass is really stepping up the pressure 94 feet now, and they're getting a positive result. They've got St. Peter's now playing at a quicker pace than they want to. Rowe. Arosa the rebound. Rensley in a hurry. Oh, they, they, they won't, they can't press him. There it is, there's the patience that we talked about. That's four passes. Five passes. Six passes and a jump shot. St. Peter's is five for five from the field in this half. Camby. So a couple of chances from the line for Camby. 
a 62% free throw shooter. It is rare to find a man this big who can shoot 75% in free throws. I thought one thing that's certainly been established here, there's no fright in St. Peter's. They're certainly not afraid of, of UMass. I think we've arrived at a point now that's dangerous. UMass has allowed St. Peter's to believe that they can beat them. And now they're going to be for a ball game until the final horn. Randy Holmes. Default. Stop. Ooh. Nasty. Oh, he's talking stuff to Candy. <laughs> Better let a sleeping dog sleep, though. Right in the row. in traffic and most of it his own team but now they settle it down and the fans they have are loving game. they're calling for the passing game now they're going to move this thing and milk that clock down a little bit st peter's when they stay patient they do a great job of breaking that press umass is overplaying too high in the back positions and as a result st peter's is throwing over top Rosa just failed. Back comes Kellogg. 39-38 St. Peter. The fans didn't like the fact that he, that Dingle brought that one back out, but I think that was a smart move. They need to settle it down and break this defense down. But the broke there didn't look like there was anywhere to go. Foul underneath. Rosa and DeFoe were both there. And it is DeFoe. First full name is Sebastian. So Boss is the short of that. That's about the only thing short, though. The jumper by Lou Rowe. Lou Rowe is tough. I'll tell you what, he, he fears no man. The baseball pass. Arosa. Got it! Did he show great balance on that play there? 14 First points. First of all, great hands to catch that pass in traffic like that. Number two, wonderful balance. Number three, the ability to square up and get the soft jump shot. Roll recover. And he smashes it. What a display of offensive skills by both teams. If you're just joining us, you might not believe this. 42-41 UMass over St. Peter's. Arosa couldn't get that to go. 14-44 to go in the second half of our game. I had Lou Rowe this summer in the Goodwill games. The one thing I know about Lou Rowe is he plays hard every minute he's on the floor. And this is a great example of it right there. Coach, you were watching earlier, and you said you'd keep an eye on him because of the death of his grandmother and the funeral he had to attend yesterday. Have you noticed any difference? I haven't seen any difference. Knowing Lou Rowe, I would almost bet you $100 that Lou Rowe has dedicated this game to his grandmother. His basket has his team ahead, 42-41. And talking about Lou Rowe, uh, they just took him out for a little rest. John Calipari took him out to get him a little breather in there. He'll be back. The jump hook by Arosa failed. And Kellogg back. And talking about getting a rest, Arosa might need a little rest in there. It looks, it looks like he's a little tired to me. He's starting to stand up straight. Weeks. Hamby. St. Peter's brings the ball up as the fans start to stand in some of the sections here. Some of them encouraging UMass and the gang at the end, cheering like crazy for their surprising Peacocks. 14 seconds on the shot clock. Here they bring Holmes off the double. He's going to have to take him one-on-one. -on -one. There's seven seconds on the shot clock right now. He's got to get off the shot in here, and he's going to do it. And he got it! A 
one-point lead for UMass. In critical situations, put the ball in the hands of a player that's hard to guard, and that's exactly what St. Peter's did. Weeks lost. It will not go for Nunez. UMass ball. Win, lose, or draw, you've got to just be in total admiration for the intense play of St. Peter's in there. They, they're, not, they're not saving anything for the second round. They're putting it all out right here today. And the reason that they're doing that because they know they'll never get to the second round if they don't leave it all here today. Rowe is back in, and DeVolk is back in for St. Peter's. No basket. No basket. And the foul will be on Kellogg. First foul of the game for Derek Kellogg. Mike, I'm trying to keep an eye on the St. Peter's players. I'm trying to get a sense from their body language what factor fatigue is going to play in this. Because UMass is really utilizing their base. They're running players in and out of the game uh, so quickly that I, I have a suspicion that John Calipari is going to play for the last five minutes of the game. He wants to wear St. Peter's down the last five minutes and then take over. St. Peter's with another chance. Let's see if this was the right call. That ball squirting around in there. Uh, it looked like it went off the St. Peter's uh, player's head. But it's not important what I think. It's important what the officials think. Boy, that was a tough pass. Try to feed the low post from the top of the circle. Looks like a trade-off in calls. Well, <laughs> Mike, you're being polite. In the coaching circles, we call that a makeup call. How soon do you... I had an official in the Pac-10. We used to... His nickname was Mascara. <laughs> Why? Because he mastered the makeup call. <laughs> Padilla for three. Oh, look at that. Foul underneath. Dante Bright with an elbow. St. Peter's trailing in the game by one with 12.38 to go, second half. Weeks comes out. The interior play has become very physical in there. We see players jockeying for position. Week just takes and throws him right out of the game. You know what you have to be concerned about, Mike, more than a foul, is the physical nature of the interior play and what effect that's going to have on the St. Peter's uh, big men when they're playing such big minutes. Griffith with a huge three-pointer. His team is ahead by two. Right into Camby. For Bright. Rowe couldn't get to the front. This is getting grueling. And when you consider the time that most of the St. Peter's players have been in, it's got to be wearing them down. And you talk about grueling physical action under the basket. It's a grueling road to Seattle, and both of these teams want to get there. They're willing to give up their body here to win this basketball game. And why not? Who wouldn't want to go to the beautiful city of Seattle, Washington? Brian Griffin that made that last shot from St. Peter's. He's really good enough to start for him, Mike. He's a really good shooter. He has NBA range. He exhibited on the last shot for St. Peter's. Born on the Caribbean island of Barbados, known as Ricky over in Brooklyn. Bro. Been to Barbados a few times. I didn't know they played basketball over there. Don't tell me you weren't there scouting. Oh, no. I'll give a tan. <laughs> It is even at 46. Chaplin and Griffin. St. Peter's hot. Nine for 13 and a half. Out of bounds, but it'll be St. Peter's. Time is stopped. And a few hearts may be around the UMass trail as this one is tied. 
a shot clock. Let's see if St. Peter's has an awareness of this and what type of play they're going to run. Denied with Sonny Chaplin, Padilla. UMass back ahead by two. Well, I know a lot of fans across the country didn't think St. Peter's would be around this long in the game as we're nearing the halfway point of the second half. What about you? I felt that St. Peter's would be around. I, I didn't. I, I never thought that this would be a blowout right here. What's more important is that St. Peter's thought they were going to be around, and they are around. And the biggest believer is the smallest man in Friendsley who just hit the three. Canby. UMass back up by one, 50 to 49, and Canby with 16. How valuable is Canby to UMass? The two games he was out with an injury, they lost. Boss defoked on Canby. Denied. But it'll be St. Peter's ball. This guy's got Bill Russell type of skills when it comes to blocking shots. Not only did he block the shot, but he gained possession of it. Chaplin couldn't get it home. Padilla. Timeout. 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 Time for a tourniquet? Well, they better call a timeout. They heard you. recovery in this position here we catch the st peter's guard standing and looking instead of sprinting back on defense this is the second time in a row that st peter's has given up at a critical stage in the game unmolested layups randy holmes most cigar back in for st peter's tyrone weeks with four personal fouls in the lineup for umass arosa holmes St. Peter's ball. Let's see if St. Peter's has made the adjustment on this inbounds play now, and they'll get some defensive structure against transition if they miss the shot. Kellogg is really denying that basketball back to uh, Mike Frensley. Off the foot. It'll be UMass and another turnover to St. Peter's. 14th turnover by the Peacocks, who trail in the game by three. We are past the halfway point of the second half. And the Peacocks are still around in a steal by Seagar. Denied by Bright. This outstanding hustle play there by Bright. He chased this ball down. He had the presence of mind to come from the side, reach in for the basketball. He read which side that the offensive player was going to take the ball to, and he went and he reached in and he saved themselves a basket. And a critical basket because that would have put St. Peter's down only one. Weeks. Grimsley went down. And a foul call to UMass. Bright with his second foul as we look at the summary. Marcus Camby with 16 points, four rebounds, four blocks. Orosa with 14, but very quiet in this half. And St. Peter's two for three in three-point attempts. Block shots have played a significant role in UMass's surge here to go ahead 52 to 49 with 926 left. Not only block shots by Marcus Candy, but by Tyrone Week and Lou Rowe also. Six total blocks by UMass. Holmes. Boy, he got it over Canby, but did not drop it off the rim and in. Kellogg to Rowe. Into camp. All right, we're going to keep track of your game in the upper left-hand side. Down below, Arkansas leads by one with 27 seconds left. Let's listen in for this finish. The Ray commits the foul. Williamson will have two free throws. Number 34. And we've got 26.9 seconds. Even if he makes them both, Texas Southern can tie it with a three. Yes, they can. Carlos Williamson with 17 points. Robert Moreland has seen his club battle ferociously after being 
put on the ropes early in the game. This guy is just a big time player right That's all he's here. Doing. <laughs> Two time SEC player of the year, second team All American. 26.9 seconds to go. A major sweat for Arkansas. And a good trip for Corliss. He bangs him two. Three point game. Knocked out of bounds by Beck. And Arkansas has forced so many turnovers on inbounds passes. Robert Moreland going to his bench, gets some more quickness in there. Randy Bolden coming into the game. Texas Southern has turned it over 20 times. Bolden is a ball handler. He's also a three-point shooter. 26.1 seconds to go. Reggie Garrett going to come in. Reggie, good defender. He'll take the place of Dwight Stewart. More quickness for Nolan Richardson's Razorbacks. You don't necessarily have to go for a three in this situation. They're down three. Texas Southern, nine for 25 from three-point range today. There's Granger. Whatever you do, though, you've got to get it done quickly. Bolden, back to Kevin Granger. Bolden, Granger's probably going to be the man. Puts it on the floor. Beck, working hard. Can't get it. Loose ball. Bolden has nine seconds. He lets it go. And there's a whistle. He and Williamson has just fouled out of the ball game with 6.1 seconds to go. And the man he just sent to the free throw line, he's a freshman, Randy Bolden, but he's the leading free throw shooter in the SWAC this year. He's an 80% free throw shooter going to the line. Talk about pressure for a freshman. Against the defending national champions, Randy Bolden has an unbelievable opportunity. Williamson has just fouled out. Randy Bolden, a freshman from Jackson, Mississippi. He went to Forest Hill High School, the Southwestern Athletic Conference freshman of the year. At 79% from the line, he's one for one today. 6.1 seconds left. If he makes all three, and only if he makes all three, will we be tied? Here we go, one of the biggest moments of the year. There's one. <laughs> one down, two to go. Two, landed home, touching all the rim. And Robert Moreland was just told to told his players if he makes it, he wants a timeout. Only defending champion to lose first round. In the they get the rebound. Thurman, it's Arkansas ball with 3.8 seconds to go. This has been a monumental game. Come on back for the final 3.8 Arkansas by one. Timeout remaining for Texas Southern. Double bonus in effect for Texas Southern with the arrow. Returning for Arkansas, number 23. Arkansas had a 17 point lead. Deck, saw, saw Texas Southern go on the lead by number four a couple of times. Deck, a 67% free throw shooter. Nolan Richardson thinks more than 0.7 seconds should have run off that clock. It was 3 8 when they inbounded. Probably as a case. Two shots. Two shots. Here's Corey Beck. That looks short right out of his hand. There's only 3.1 <laughs> seconds left in the game. That's not much time. It is enough time, however, as Texas Southern calls timeout to get a good shot. Okay, okay, we're going to send you back to Albany now, back to Knickerbocker Arena, where UMass is taking control of this game. 58 to 49 with 443 left. Here's Mike Emmerich and George Rabelow. He was spin over in the lane, holding on to his pants. Mark 
Marcus Camby has just been fouled in the He's going to try to convert a three-point play, but his team has just turned it on here against St. Peter's in the last four minutes of play. What's happened here, Mike, for the viewers who are just joining us, is that UMass has just wore St. Peter's down with their depth and, and their physical presence. It, the last four or five minutes, the St. Peter's big men have just walked down the court. And it's been almost seven minutes now since St. Peter's has scored. They have no interior offense at all now, Mike. Friendly foul. Boy, you still see that jaw thrust out. He's still a tiger there, isn't he? Despite the fact that his team is down by 12. St. Peter's has no seniors on the team, so they're basically going to have the same team back next year. So some of those players on the bench are going to have to step up and become more productive. But this game's far from over. Four, four minutes and 19 seconds. They still got plenty of time to get back in this game. Get a couple defensive stops, hit a couple threes, and it gets interesting again. Nine points for Friendsley. 61-51 and some pressure from St. Peter's. Broken with a pass to Rowe. They put the hands in the, the ball in the hands of their leader. Come on, there. And then Camby. And then two. We'll take you back down to Austin for the finish of Arkansas, Texas Southern. Corey Beck on the line for his second shot. Arkansas leads by one, three seconds on the clock. Here's Dave Sin. That's what pressure looks like when you're the defending national champions and you've been taking to, taken to the limit. Well, for Texas Southern, if there's a miss here, they have to get the rebound. They got to block out. They got to handle the ball cleanly. Beck missed it on purpose. Now they got to go. Whereas Whitaker is going to have to put it up and get it Did not get it off. And Arkansas survived a million scare from Texas Southern. 79 to 78. What a game! Nolan Richardson club wasted a 17-point lead. So Arkansas fans around the country breathe a sigh of relief as the Hogs advance. One point they win by. Let's go back to Albany and UMass and St. Peter's. UMass with a 14-point lead here in Albany, but it hasn't always been dominance by UMass in this game. Canby misses. Along with George Raveling, Mike Emmerich from Knickerbocker Arena. St. Peter's a definite scare, especially in the first half. Friendsley can't get it to go. And they just cannot get a second shot at the basket right now. And if, if you look at the St. Peter's players, they're bent over, holding on to their shorts. They're just fatigued. Earlier today, Stanford, by two, advanced. Old Dominion and Villanova, first game tonight. A little later on, it'll be Tulsa and Illinois. Mike Friendsley. Mike Friendsley comes to the bench. And a lot of fans here, and some of them wearing UMass colors, are giving that young man an ovation. So we're down to two and a half. Seeger. Bet ahead for Griffith, but that failed and traveling. St. Peter's ball, and it's down to 2.08 to go now. There's Marcus Camby out with 25.7 rebounds and four block shots. Timeout called by UMass. They have a 14 point lead. We'll be right back. Okay, new rules. Individuals are no longer more important than the team. You want a piece of that championship? Put it in here. Nobody can do it alone, but together we can do it. Sports magazines include more team football.
That's why if it doesn't... It's going to take wonderful fortune. Some threes, which Randy Holmes has not been able to connect on this half, at least this stage of this half. In essence, a miracle, a Rosa. I think Pete Peters needs to take the first good shot available. Don't get sucked into the three-point shot here. Some indecision, but it looks as though it's UMass ball. A minute and 58 seconds is a lifetime. 19 turnovers make that 20 now. 20 turnovers by St. Peter's. Block is their enemy. 14-point deficit. UMass being very deliberate about all this. Eight on the shot clock. Padilla. Seventeen-point lead for the Minutemen. Tomorrow morning, somebody in South Dakota is going to get up and look at the score, and they're going to think that this was a blowout. And for the great part of this game, it was St. Peter's really gave UMass all that they could handle. We're down in Tallahassee today. Four games, just as we're having up here in Albany. Iowa State and North Carolina have advanced. North Carolina being Murray State, 80 to 70. Tonight, a green team on St. Patrick's Day, Michigan State and Weber State. Later on, Georgetown and Xavier, Ohio. The Georgetown Xavier, Ohio could be a very dangerous basketball game for Georgetown. But Xavier's got a, a wonderful basketball team. It's interesting, Pete Gill and the coach at Providence, they were talking to him about Xavier and their great run, and he's, of course, he had been there for nine years. He said, yeah, they're getting coaching this year. <laughs> well, Providence <laughs> College is getting coaching, too. Sonny Chapman is in for Mo Seagar. One minute to go, second half. coaching like it's a one-point game there. He's really interesting, up. yeah. He's all over him about execution there. He was yelling to Dingle, get out on the floor, get out on the floor. Six on the shot clock, Weeks and Kellogg. And now the game clock is the shot clock, and it's a matter of time. But St. Peter's can be proud of, uh, of the effort that they put out here to, in this game. They don't have anything to be ashamed of. Fans are standing all over the Knickerbocker Arena right now. They have to play another five seconds, and then the congratulations will start. Kellogg and Griffiths. The genuine Chevrolet players of the game, Marcus Camby from UMass, Luis Arosa from St. Peter's. Our congratulations to them. Congratulations to both teams. These wonderful schools, but just worn out at the end with St. Peter's. They had no baskets in the last 11 minutes and 12 seconds. And so advancing today here in Albany, Stanford and UMass. Tonight, Villanova and Old Dominion, Tulsa and Illinois. Now back to Pat O'Brien and our studios in New York. play today he says we're going home the men in charge